In the summer of 1978, Eric Wilson, a 19-year-old male from Ottawa, Canada, was preparing to start a college summer semester in Boulder, Colorado. Eric was planning on making this trip from his home in Canada to Boulder, Colorado in his 1973 white Volkswagen camper van. This is the last time that Eric Wilson would ever be seen alive. Eric Chester Wilson was born to parents Marilyn and William Wilson in Ottawa, Canada. And because this case occurred in the late 70s, I couldn't actually find a whole lot of information on Eric's uh, home life. Um, it was more so just information about the case that's online. From what I could find, Eric's family were quite wealthy. Eric had a younger brother, Peter, and throughout some time in his childhood, his parents did get a divorce and his dad did move to California. Um, and I'm not sure whether he remarried or not, but there is mention of another stepbrother in California. On the 10th of July, 1978, Eric Wilson was due to leave on his trip to Boulder, Colorado. Eric had saved up for three months in order to make this trip from Ottawa to Colorado and it, this trip was going to take him five days. He tried to get someone to go with him but unfortunately he couldn't get anyone to go with him so he was going to be making the trek on his own. As Eric was packing the van getting ready to leave on that day on July 10th, his mother Marilyn was double checking that he had everything ready. Eric was completely prepared. He even joked um, that he had had the van serviced which he had. The one thing Marilyn did ask of Eric was that he be safe and don't pick up any hitchhikers. Four days into the trip, on Friday the 14th, Eric phoned home and informed his parents that he was having some trouble with the van and that he would call the next day on the Saturday at 5pm to notify them of an update. Saturday was actually the day that Eric was meant to be arriving in Boulder, but because of this van issue he was going to be set back. When 5pm on the Saturday came around, Marilyn made note that Eric didn't call but thought He's just getting the van serviced, he obviously can't get to a payphone. Eric was due to be arriving in Boulder on that Saturday, and shortly after he was going to arrive, he was actually going to visit his father and stepbrother in Madeira, California. So when Eric didn't call on the Saturday, Marilyn called Eric's father, William, in California to see if he'd come by. And William said no, he hadn't. He obviously just forgot to call, he was obviously getting the van fixed, um, and to, he was quite optimistic and just said, don't worry about it. However, when Sunday night came around the next day and Eric still hadn't called, they knew something was wrong. Eric was not the type of person that would miss two nights in a row. Eric was the type of person that in college would call every Saturday at 6pm, not because he had anything to say, but just because his parents had asked him to. So when he hadn't called two nights in a row, they knew that something was wrong. The following morning on the Monday when Eric still hadn't called, Marilyn and Eric's brother Peter went into their local police station to report Eric missing. Peter recalls them being quite visibly upset and they didn't really get the response from police that they were after. Police told Marilyn and Peter that their computer would be absolutely jammed if they reported every child missing who hadn't called their mother when they were supposed to and that because Eric had called from Nebraska, that it wasn't any of their business and that they should contact police in Nebraska. Police in Canada weren't being very helpful, so Peter, Eric's brother, actually travelled down to Nebraska with Eric's father who met him over from California. At this point, no one had heard from Eric in five days and all they had to go off was that he'd called from somewhere in Nebraska on that Friday. William and Peter started going to local police stations in Nebraska in hopes of getting Eric reported missing. And the response they continued to receive was, come back in 30 days. Police didn't want to know about Eric's case and they seemed to label him as a runaway despite what his family was saying. They would continue to ask Peter questions like, did he have any issues with alcohol? Did he have any issues with drugs? Did he have any issues within the family that might make him want to run away? Despite what the family was saying, they just wouldn't listen. Police would not agree to put Eric Wilson into the National Crime Database as they determined that no crime had been committed because there was no body and nothing had been stolen. The only way police would put Eric in the database was if a crime had been committed. So Eric's brother Peter suggested that they report the van stolen as then a crime would have been committed. Police agreed to this but that the family would have to report Eric as the person that stole the vehicle as he was the last person seen with it. Eric's family were willing to do this if this put him in the database. However, police response to this was well, if he stole the vehicle, it's obvious he's run away. With police essentially ignoring the family, they decided to reach out to the FBI. And the FBI in Nebraska were really hard to get in contact with, 
And when they eventually did get in contact with them, they received the same response of come back in 30 days. So the Wilsons reached out to a family friend back in Canada who actually worked alongside the US FBI. And through this, they were able to get a US FBI agent to their hotel room to question them, but essentially nothing really came of this. The two men began traveling through Nebraska, looking pretty much anywhere they could. They were going to um, petrol stations with a photo of Eric, hospitals, motels, mechanics, uh, Volkswagen dealers. They were going anywhere they could to try and find any ev evidence of Eric that they could. Uh, no one had seen him. All hospitals had all of their patients accounted for, so there was no Eric Wilson's, no John Doe's, um, and no one at any motel, mechanic, hospital had seen them. The family knew that Eric had a map of uh, the campgrounds along his route, so they even checked all of the campgrounds, and the public even started to notice. Someone at a campground put up a sign saying, Eric Wilson, please call home. Uh, but the police were still offering no help, and no one still had any sign of Eric. After 1,200 miles of traveling to different spots, trying to find out any information they could, they had nothing. So they decided their efforts might be better off back in Ottawa, Canada, and they went home. Meanwhile, back at home, Marilyn is trying to get their phone bill early so that they can find out where Eric called from in Nebraska on that Friday. Unfortunately, she was not able to get their phone bill sent out early. Once back at home, it had been two weeks since Eric had last been heard from, and a letter shows up to their front door, addressed to Eric Wilson. This letter is from American Express, and it says that if Eric wishes to replace the traveler's checks that he had that were reported stolen, he would have to fill in this form and send it back. This was the first lead that the family had had in two weeks, and at least they knew now that something had happened to Eric. They at least knew that he had been robbed. So the Wilsons called American Express, and American Express, unfortunately, were not able to give them the details of the traveler's checks without Eric's consent or a court order. And a court order, unfortunately, was rejected. So they weren't able to get the information from American Express. Fifteen days since Eric Wilson had last been heard from, two men were pulled over in a white Volkswagen camper in Brunswick, Maine. These men had tried to sell a stolen tape deck to a local lawyer who had reported their license plate and police were able to pull them over. These two men were Raymond Hatch and Bertram Davis. Police were not too concerned about the lawyer incident, they were more so concerned about who the driver of the vehicle was, and that was 34-year-old Raymond Hatch. Raymond Hatch was well known to police and actually had a lengthy criminal record, and he was wanted for a previous crime of car theft. So when police pulled the two men over, they immediately became suspicious of the vehicle that they were driving. They know that this probably isn't Raymond Hatch's car due to his criminal record, so they decide to run the license plates. This van had Texas license plates, and after a quick run of the plates, they quickly discovered that these plates did not belong to the van. So without the van's real license plates, all they could do was run the van's serial number into the crime database to see if it showed up, and there is no match for a stolen vehicle. This van is actually stolen and is in the database as Eric Wilson's stolen vehicle. However, when police entered the vehicle into the database as being stolen by Eric Wilson, they only entered the van's Ontario license plates and not the serial number, so no match showed up. Raymond Hatch is then arrested, and Detective Taylor, one of the detectives that pulled the two men over, continues digging into the missing van to try and find out what he had. Detective Taylor phones Volkswagen head office in Germany and they inform him that this van had never been exported into the United States and had actually been exported to a dealership in Ontario, Canada. The van is then identified as the Wilson's missing vehicle. The Wilson's described this as bittersweet because they assumed that when they found the van they would find Eric and that's not the case anymore. And now that the vehicle had been found with no Eric, police finally started to show interest and a police search for Eric Wilson was put together three weeks after he went missing. Marilyn and Peter traveled down to Brunswick, Maine to view the van, and Peter described it as it was never how Eric would have left it. The van was disgusting, there was different types of drugs all over the floor, pills, rubbish, alcohol bottles, so it became clear to police that Raymond Hatch and Bertram Davis had probably had the van for a while. At this point, Raymond Hatch is serving 60 days in prison for that previous car theft charge, and a police search has now been put together for Eric Wilson. So the family assumed that the police are going to take care of it and travel back to Ottawa, Canada. Two months go by, and the family don't hear much from police, 
And now Raymond Hutch is about to get out of prison, as he's only serving 60 days. And the family's informed that once Raymond Hatch is released, he's immediately travelling to Connecticut. As Raymond Hatch is the only lead that they have in this case, they would really like to keep him in Brunswick, Maine, in order to get more information out of him. So the family ask if they can charge Hatch with the theft of the Wilson van. This is rejected by the district attorney, as they say they have no proof that Eric Wilson didn't just give Raymond Hatch the van or sell it to him. What the DA offered instead was to strike a deal with Hatch and ask him to meet with the family and to take a lie detector test and that if Hatch accepted that nothing he would say would be held against him. At this point no one was accusing Raymond Hatch of doing anything other than having the Wilson vehicle. So police were selling it to Hatch like we have a family who's really upset, their son's gone missing, you ended up with his van. Is it okay if we question you and just find out what you know about the van or how you came to have the van? Police weren't really giving the Wilson family any other option, so they accepted the deal to meet with Raymond Hatch. And Raymond Hatch actually accepted this police deal. The family went to meet Raymond Hatch just as he was coming out of his lie detector test. And they were told by the operator, he has never seen your boy, and that Raymond Hatch had passed. However, we know, and if you're familiar with crime cases, you know that polygraphs are not always accurate, and police have stated that this operator is questionable. Hatch spoke to the Wilsons and told them that he was sorry about what had happened to Eric. Now, this was a interesting comment to make at the time, because no one actually knew what had happened to Eric. When Hatch was asked how he came to have the van, he said that he and Bertram Davis were picked up by two men in Texas on July 19th. That's five days after Eric Wilson went missing. When Peter asked Hatch to describe these two men, he originally said that one had curly blonde hair, which would match Eric Wilson's description. He then changed his statement to say that he actually had long dark hair and that his name was John. According to Hatch, after they were picked up, they traveled to Nebraska where they got into some sort of argument and Hatch and Davis stole the vehicle, bringing it to Brunswick, Maine, and that's where they were arrested by Detective Taylor on July 26th. They said that they had never seen Eric Wilson. No one believed that Raymond Hatch was telling the truth. However, they had nothing to keep him in Brunswick, Maine, so he was free to go. But before he left, he pulled Eric's brother Peter aside and said, I think I have some of your brother's possessions. He then took Peter to the back of a local pizza shop and pulled out a sleeping bag full of Eric's things. Peter described this as very confusing because he said he knew he was looking into the eyes of someone that had hurt his brother, but that Hatch was being so nice to him, he didn't know how to feel. From here, the family is unsure of where to go, and it's actually suggested to them by a police officer that they should get in contact with a private investigator. This is when the family hired a very reputable private investigator, Jim Conway. Jim immediately took on the case after hearing how police had treated the Wilsons throughout the case, and he decided that his first point of call would be to follow up on those traveler's checks that had been reported as stolen. And Jim Conway was actually able to get the American Express information on where the traveler's checks were used. Some of these checks had Eric's legitimate signature on them, and then some of them had a forged signature. While Conway was accessing this information, he decided to pay Raymond Hatch a visit in Connecticut where he was living, and pretended to be an insurance broker just to get a sense of what Hatch was like, as he was the main suspect in this case. At this time, the Wilsons were finally able to get their phone bill, and this phone bill was able to determine that the last time that Eric Wilson had called the family home on that Friday was a place called North Platte, Nebraska. A motel in North Platte was the last place that Eric Wilson's legitimate signature had been used. So all this information was actually coming in, finally, to tie this case together and to give them legitimate leads on where to go. The desk clerk at the Comforter Motel actually remembered seeing Eric Wilson on that Saturday morning and remembered him asking where he could take the van to get it serviced. And she pointed him to a local mechanic up the street. This mechanic shop was actually a shop that William and Peter had checked twice when they had done their initial search through Nebraska months ago. And Conway received the same response that William and Peter did and that was that none of the staff had ever seen Eric Wilson. But Conway knew that this had to be the place as this is where the desk clerk had pointed Eric and Conway came to the conclusion that one of the staff must be lying due to there being no report of the van. Conway believed that whichever staff member was lying had never reported the van as being serviced there and had actually pocketed the money. Conway went back to the mechanics 
and with a little more pushing, confirmed his theory when a staff member named Charlie remembered the three men. Charlie had seen the three men and claimed that they were traveling together, but that Hatch and Davis seemed to be scared of Eric Wilson and were standing on either side of him like they were scared he was going to run away. Conway now had Eric, Hatch and Davis placed together in Nebraska, but had no idea where they went to next. Conway then spent the next two weeks driving all over the US with a photo of Eric, Hatch and Davis and not one other person could identify Eric, Raymond Hatch or Bertram Davis from their photos. That was until Conway found himself in a remote town in Arizona in a camera shop following up on a traveler's check. The shop clerk remembered Hatch and Davis coming in and buying something from the camera shop with Eric Wilson's traveler's checks. This then placed Hatch and Davis with Eric Wilson's van and traveler's checks with no Eric Wilson. So Conway decided that it was probably time to go after a confession. So he decided to go back to Maine. Conway then made two phone calls, one to Mrs. Wilson to inform her of what he was about to do, and another one to US FBI agent Richard Foster. Richard Foster had already been briefed on the case by Conway and I couldn't really work out their relationship, but I think that Foster was helping Conway when he needed it. Conway told Foster that he would be returning the next day and that he wanted Foster to bring in Bertram Davis the following day when Conway got back, as Bertram Davis was the weaker link of the two. Foster did not wait for Conway to return the following day and instead had Bertram Davis in custody within an hour to question him himself. Davis immediately broke down and confessed that he had watched Raymond Hatch stab Eric Wilson to death. Raymond Hatch was then arrested a few hours later in Connecticut and Foster was going to try and use Davis's confession to get a confession out of Raymond Hatch. According to Bertram Davis, he and Raymond Hatch had been hitchhiking through Texas when Eric Wilson pulled over and picked them up. They then drove to North Platte, Nebraska, where the van suffered some issues and they needed to get it repaired. Hatch and Davis had a plan all along that they were going to rob Eric Wilson of his van and leave him stranded. However, once the van had been repaired, Eric Wilson was only 30 minutes away from Boulder, Colorado, his final destination. So the two men knew that if they were going to act on their plan, they needed to do it now. What they were going to do was when Eric pulled up to get gas, they were going to steal his traveler's checks and take the van and leave him inside the petrol station. However, when Eric went inside to pay for his gas, he took the traveler's checks in with him. So the men changed their plan. When Eric returned to the van, the two men grabbed him, drugged him, bound and gagged him and threw him in the back of the van. The men started to drive and a few miles up the road realized what they had done and that they were going to have to get rid of Eric Wilson somehow. They threw him, while he was still drugged outside of the van, into a ditch on the side of the road and drove off. Before long, the men became worried that when Eric came to, that he would be able to identify them. So they decided to turn around to re-kidnap Eric. Eric Wilson, still unconscious, was replaced in the back of the van and tied to the refrigerator. The men continued to drive, and as they drove, they argued about what to do with Eric. According to Bertrand Davis, he wanted to let Eric go, while Hatch was convinced that Eric would be able to identify them, and that if they got caught, the punishment for kidnapping was the exact same as murder. The men continued to argue throughout the afternoon, not knowing that Eric had regained consciousness in the back, and was listening to his captors debate his fate. The men were now just out of Denver, not far from the Rocky Mountains, and the band was slowly running out of gas. So they knew that they couldn't risk going to a petrol station with Eric Wilson tied up in the back. So they had to act now. The two men pulled the van off the highway, dragged Eric Wilson out the back of the van, over train tracks and into a bushed area. Raymond Hatch then stabs Eric Wilson to death. After this confession, Bertram Davis and Raymond Hatch are charged with the first degree murder of Eric Wilson. FBI agent Richard Foster takes full credit on solving this case and says that he had actually broken the case two weeks prior and says it's purely a coincidence that Jim Conway called him just hours before he was going in to arrest Hatch and Davis with his own information that Bertram Davis's fingerprints had been found on the traveler's checks. Richard Foster claims that Jim Conway offered no useful information to police and that the case would have ended the exact same had he been hired by the Wilsons or not. Jim Conway's response to this is, if he gets a medal, fine. I just hope none of his kids get lost out there. The FBI actually told the Wilsons that they knew that Raymond Hatch had previously murdered and had just had no time 
or money to be able to arrest him. Ten months later, in May of 1979, Eric Wilson's body is found near Cameo in Mesa County in the area that Bertram Davis had described. So <laughs> you would think that the questionable police and FBI work would end here, um, and that's not even close. Four days before Eric Wilson is murdered, Raymond Hatch is arrested in Pennsylvania with that previous car theft charge. Raymond Hatch had a warrant for his arrest in Maine for this charge. However, it was going to cost $200 to send Hatch from Pennsylvania to Maine, and the Pennsylvania police didn't want to pay this money. So they actually let him go. And four days later, Eric Wilson was stabbed to death. Eric Wilson was killed for $700 worth of traveler's checks, two drums of gasoline, two gasoline cards, and his 1973 Volkswagen camper by a man who should have been in prison but slipped through the cracks. From the date of being charged, it took 18 months for Raymond Hatch to be extradited from Connecticut to Colorado to stand trial. This wait time was because the paperwork had his name wrong. I've seen some sources say that instead of saying Raymond Walter Hatch, it said Walter Raymond Hatch. And I've also seen that instead of saying Raymond Walter Hatch, it said Robert Walter Hatch. So... Bertram Davis made a deal with police to testify against Raymond Hatch on one condition. This condition was that he would have a lesser sentence and would be able to spend out his sentence in a prison outside of Colorado, as Raymond Hatch had threatened Davis's life if Davis told anyone about the murder. Police needed Bertram Davis's confession in order to be able to convict Raymond Hatch, so they agreed to this. While waiting for his trial, Bertram Davis was spending out his time in a prison outside of Colorado, but was targeted in a prison riot for being a snitch. After this riot, Bertram Davis was sent back to Colorado, where he began to receive death threats from Raymond Hatch, and this meant that he, he wouldn't testify anymore, he was too scared of him. Due to there being no testimonial evidence, the judge threw out the death penalty in the case of Raymond Hatch. Raymond Hatch struck a deal with prosecutors that he would save the state the time and money of going through a lengthy trial and would plead guilty to second degree murder in order to get a lesser sentence and receive credit for the two years that he had already spent in prison waiting for his trial. This deal was accepted. Raymond Hatch assaulted and threatened multiple guards at his hearing. He was sentenced to serve 24 to 26 years in prison with a minimum of 20 years and Bertram Davis was sentenced to 10 to 12 years in prison. However, Bertram Davis was released after just two years and Hatch only served 12. Raymond Hatch was released on the 17th of July, 1993 and returned to Brunswick, Maine, where just a year later was charged with the assault of his girlfriend, Beverly Hafford, after stabbing her with an eight inch steak knife. He was sentenced to a minimal assault charge and was sentenced to 364 days in prison and a $10 fine and was actually released after just nine months. He then lived in different areas of Maine for the remainder of his life until he passed away at the age of 53 in the year 2000. I couldn't find much on the Wilsons themselves um, in the following of this case. I do know that they had a small memorial for Eric not long after his passing, but I don't actually know much about their later life. This case was made into a documentary called Just Another Missing Kid by the Fifth Estate, and this was created in 1980 and it blew up. It won an Oscar. It was um, it was very popular in the 80s. Um, so I will link that below. That is where I did get a lot of my information because there's not a whole lot of information on this case. Um, and I have heard that there is a follow-up documentary, but I could not find it. So if I can find it, I will link that below as well, because I'm sure that probably will go into a bit of detail about the Wilsons later in life. This case is very frustrating and it's very obvious that it comes down to money for the police, money and time, and that Eric Wilson fell through the cracks. It is tra it's tragic what happened to Eric Wilson, but this is why I've named the case the search for Eric Wilson, because I was more baffled by the struggles that his family had to go through in order to find out what had happened to Eric, and the amount of times they were told no, or had to jump through hoops in order to get just information on their son. It's ridiculous. I wish there was a happy ending to this case. Unfortunately, you know, there's not. It seems that 
Raymond Hatch pretty much got minimal sentence for everything and was able to repeat offend and didn't really learn a lesson. So unfortunately there's no happy ending, but thank you for watching.